Hello. This is a response to a question I had posted on Bro Lawrence's presentation entitled Alter Bay to speak out about apostasy in the church. I tried posting this response several times without success, so decided to post this video and share its link instead. Perhaps you could largely ignore to respond to my question because they think it's a side issue. Now let's see how relevant it is to the question that Brother Lawrence had asked about apostasy in the church. I had asked what sifting means in the context that Ellen White had used it. I asked this because Prof. Vaith quoted it from minute 641. The church may appear is about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. Ellen White wrote this in a letter written from Basel, Switzerland to G.I. Brother S. N. Haskell, December 1886. You can find the letter here. Oak Writings, ORS 70, 1489. It is a long letter that addresses the challenges the church faces with the assurance that it will become victorious in the end. She mentions sifting and sifted in two paragraphs which respectively say, All the policy in the world cannot save us from a terrible sifting, and all the efforts made with high authorities will not lift from us the scourging of God, just because sin is cherished. If as a people we do not keep ourselves in the faith and not only advocate with pen and voice the commandments of God, but keep them every one, not violating a single step knowingly, then weakness and ruin will come upon us. It is a work that we must attend to, in every one of our churches, each man must be a Christian. The Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up power as supreme. The church made pure is about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains. While the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the shaft separated from the precious wheat. This is the terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. None but those who have been overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found, the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. We must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. As we will see later from the Bible, the seed used to sift is God's truth and there will be clear distinction between those who stand by this truth and those who rely on their self-righteousness. This already answers Brother Lawrence's question, anything that is contrary to God's truth in the church. In two other paragraphs that follow these ones, Ellen White says, Are we so insensible as a peculiar people, a holy nation, to the inexpressible love that God has manifested for us? Salvation is not to be baptized not to have our names upon the church books, not to preach the truth. But it is a living union with Jesus Christ to be nude in heart, doing the works of Christ in faith and labor of love, in patience, meekness, and hope. Every soul united to Christ will be a missionary to all around him. He will labor for those near and those afar off. He will have no sectional feeling, no interest merely to build up one branch of the work of which he presides in their New Zealand. Although work with interest to make every branch strong, there will be no self-love, no selfish interests. The cause is one, the truth, the great hope. Manuscript to Elises, volume 12, page 3, well, 226, paragraph 2. This gives us a hint that sifting out does not necessarily mean leaving the church since salvation is not merely having our names in church books. What may the question be asked with earnest, anxious heart? Is envy church? Is jealousy permitted to find a place in my heart? If so Christ not there, do I love the law of God as the love of Jesus Christ in my heart? If we love one another as Christ has loved us, then we are getting ready for the blessed heaven of peace and rest. There is no struggle in there to be first, to have the supremacy all will love their neighbors themselves. Oh, that God have opened the understanding and speak to the hearts of our churches by arousing the individual members. 
so I may be in the church while Christ is not in my heart. She had just Purpius who said in the same letter, the remnant that purified their souls by obeying the truth, gather strength from the trying process, exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. All these, he says, I have graven of the palms of my hands. Isaiah 49, 16. They are held in everlasting and perishable remembrance. We want faith now, living faith. We will have a living testimony that should cleanse the heart of the sinner. There is too much sermonizing and too little ministering. We want the holy unction. We need the spirit and fervor of the truth. Many of the ministers are half paralyzed by their own defects of character. They need the converting power of God. In line with the sifting, there is a remnant. Then in a latter paragraph, she wrote, those who are at ease in Zion need to be aroused. Great is their accountability who bear the truth and yet feel no weight of burden for souls. Oh, for men and women professing the truth to arouse, to take on the yoke of Christ, to lift his burdens. There are one of those who will not have merely a nominal interest, but a Christ-like interest, unselfish, and in intense ardor that will not flag under difficulty or appeal because they make plea balance. Now that we have a better understanding of the context of the same letter, let's compare with a few other statements of Ellen White from other places. On every hand, we see those who have had much light and knowledge otherably choosing evil in the place of good. Making no attempt to reform, they are growing worse and worse. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 62, Through Union with the World, the Church Will Become Corrupt, a Cage of Every Unclean and Hateful Bird. Review on Herald Feb, 26, 1895, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 347. The truth for this time is precious, but those whose hearts have not been broken by falling on the rock Christ, Jesus will not see, understand what is truth. They will accept that which pleases their ideas, and will begin to manufacture another foundation than that which is laid. They will flatter their own vanity and esteem, thinking that they are capable of removing the pillars of our faith, and replacing them with pillars they devised. This will continue to be as long as time shall last. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, Page 415 after the truth has been proclaimed as a witness to all nations, every conceivable power of evil will be set in operation, and minds will be confused by many voices crying, Lo, here is Christ. Lo, he is there. This is the truth. I have the message from God. He has sent me with great light. Then there will be a removing of the landmarks and an attempt to tear down the pillars of our faith. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible, Commentary, Volume 7, Page 9885. What did Ellen White mean by foundation and pillars? Please do your own study to find out. Just a clue. She often used the terms, while referring to the fundamental principles of the church by then. The cause of Christ will be betrayed. Those who have had the light of truth and have enjoyed its blessings, but who have turned away from it, will fight down the Spirit of God. Inspired with the Spirit from beneath, they will tear down that which they once built up, and show to all reasonable, God-fearing souls that they cannot be trusted. They may lay claim to truth and righteousness, but their spirit and works will testify that they are betrayers of their Lord. Review and Herald, May 24, 1898. The Lord will raise up men to bear the message of truth to the world and to his people if those in responsible positions do not move onward in the opening providence of God, bearing an appropriate message for this time. The words of warning will be given to others who will be faithful to their trust. Even youthful Christians will be chosen to cry aloud and spare not. Testimonies on Sabbath School Work, page 46. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called for the counsel of the true witness to the Laudations. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver, and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. And some will not bear the straight testimony, they will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 186. 
There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep that constantly before the people and bring him up to have a trouble beforehand. There is to be a shaking among God's people, but this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. It will be the result of refusing the truth presented. The minister of us should not feel they have some wonderful advanced ideas, and unless all receive these, they will be shaken out, and the people will rise to go forward and upward to the victory. Satan's object is accomplished, just so will surely when men run ahead of Christ and do the work. He is never entrusted to their hands, as when they remain in the lost and state, lukewarm, feeling rich, and increased with goods, and in need of nothing, the two classes are equally stumbling blocks. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 13. Satan hopes to involve the remnant people of God, the general ruin that is coming upon the earth. As the coming of Christ draws nigh, he will be more determined and decisive in his efforts to overthrow Men and women will arise professing to have some new light or some new revelation, whose tendency is to unsettle faith in the old landmarks. Their doctrines will not bear the test of God's word, yet souls will be deceived. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 295, paragraph 3. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Counsels to writers and editors, page 40, paragraph 1. When those who are nine with the world, yet claiming great purity, plead for union with those who have ever been opposers to the cause of truth, we should fear and shun them as decidedly as it did Nehemiah. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. And at that time, the superficial conservative class, whose influence and fullness steadily retarded the progress of the work, will renounce the faith and take their stand with the two enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. These apostates will then manifest the most deliberate enmity, doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren, and to excite indignation against them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 463. When the day comes when the law of God is made void, and the church is sifted by the fire trials as to try all the little on the earth, a great proportion of those supposed to be genuine will, will heed to seducing spirits, and will turn traitors and betray sacred trust. They will prove our very worst persecutors. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 165. I saw that God's honest children, among the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches, and before the plague should be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this, and before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious boys that those who have rejected the whole truth may think the cry is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine, and all who are nice will lead the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Early writings, page 261. Let's conclude by looking at the Bible. Although the concept of sifting is found in many places in the Bible, the specific term is found in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 28, Amos chapter 9, verse 9, and Luke chapter 22, verse 31. The passages share several thematic similarities, particularly in their use of the concept of sifting and the broader implications of divine judgment and spiritual testing in the Reality, Isaiah 30, 28. This verse describes God sifting the nations with a sieve of vanity, indicating a process of judgment that separates the righteous from the wicked, the immature justice, the realms and nations, leading to destruction for the proud and unfaithful. Here, God states that he will sift the house of Israel among all nations, using the sieve metaphor to illustrate the separation of his faithful remnant from those who are unfaithful. This implies divine filtering process where only the true believers will be preserved. As we have said at the beginning, it's God's truth that acts as the sieve that separates true believers and non-believers. 12 speaks about a remnant who are called by God's name, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, the Hebrew term translated here is name, mission, shame, which means his name, reputation, fame, glory, or the name as designation of God. The Hebrew term translated here, Lord, is all, Vaheo, Va, which is Jehovah, the existing one, the proper name of the one true God. Luke 22:31. 31. 
In this passage, Jesus tells Peter that Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. This indicates a spiritual trial or testing that Peter and the disciples will undergo, emphasizing the challenge of maintaining faith amidst adversity. This means sifting does not only occur in the corporate church, but also within individuals. Will you stand the sifting in your own life?